Hello, and welcome back to another exciting episode. If you're enjoying this channel, please take a moment to subscribe, like, and comment. I'll do my best to try to answer any questions you might have. Today, we're going to clear coat this Ibanez Joe Satriani JS5 that's been hand-painted and signed by an artist named Raven in, from Australia using acrylic paints, the same stuff you use uh, to paint paintings with. Uh, it's a replica of Carol Satriani's work named Rainforest and it's a very good one indeed. Since the original were hand painted, there are very few of the uh, originals around. This one's a replica done in the style of the Donnie or the JS3 series. Also brought to me by the same customer and replicated by the same Australian artist. JS3, or Donnie, gets its nickname from the late artist Donnie Hunt, who was a personal friend of Satriani. Each JS3 was hand painted by Hunt, therefore, each is a unique creation. to give this one the same treatment as the Donnie. Shipped all the way from Australia in bubble wrap, it arrived here in perfect condition, but it's going to get a nice protective finish of 2K. We're going to assemble it and set it up as well. On this one, we're also going to refinish the neck, which had a black face and silver logo, and do it in natural maple with a black logo. I've already stripped and clear coated the face. The logo is a vinyl laser cutout transfer that's very thin. The decal is burnished with a credit card to ensure it's fully adhered. Then, very carefully, protective layer is removed. Now the face of the neck is ready for a couple more clear coats. This is the finish I'm using. It's a two-part poly finish. I spray very lightly at first and then let it flash off a bit before I apply heavier coats just to be safe and avoid any potential chemical reactions. Different from nitrocellulose based finishes. Because it's two parts, it cures more like an epoxy. Part A and part B equal part C. With nitro, you must spray many coats to get the same results. Nitro is basically solids dissolved in solvents. When the solvents evaporate, it leaves behind the solids. That process can take a couple of weeks, whereas Polly is ready to sand and buff the next day. Wet sanding is next. It can take several hours to wet sand and a couple of hours to buff it out on the buffer. I start with 600 grit, 1000 grit, 1500, 2000 grit, 3000 grit, and 5000 grit sandpaper. Yes, that's a lot of time. And work, but the results are definitely worth it. 
These 3M Trizac pads have been a game changer for me. They're expensive, but you can use them over and over. And if you take care of them, they can be reused indefinite amount of time. They have a nice foam backing as well, which helps prevent scratching, like uh, like paperback abrasives. Paperback abrasives are fine and necessary, but I found that if you're not careful in the way you use them, it's possible to put deep scratches into your hard work caused by the edge of the paper. The 3,000 and 5,000 grits will erase those. It makes the final buff much easier. Here's a little tip when wet sanding. I add a little dishwashing soap to my water. It lubricates the paper and helps it stay clear of finished particles and extends the life of the paper. It also makes sanding go a little smoother. Let's talk about buffing for a minute. With 2K, I use Menzerna compounds on the floor-mounted buffing machine, running at about 1,400 RPM, starting with a heavy cut, medium cut, and final cut compounds. I'll then chase it with a swirl mark remover. With nitro finishes, I use a slower speed around 7,000 RPM to 10,000 RPM at most. I could do a whole video on sanding and buffing alone, and I think I will, because it's a subject that a lot of people would be interested in. Here I'm starting with a heavy cut compound and then moving to the final cut compound to test if I missed anything. It took about an hour to buff this one. Going back to touch up and sand spots that I may have missed or needed a little bit more sanding. Okay, we're all buffed up and ready to assemble this masterpiece. Here's another tip I learned from one of my mentors. Apply a little candle wax or paraffin to the threads of a screw you're putting into a newly drilled pilot hole and melt it. It helps make the screw thread in smoothly, helps prevent screw breakage, and protects the screw from rusting over time. When installing the tuners, and especially after refinishing, it's prudent to carefully check that the barrel of the tuner can be inserted into the hole without a fight. You want a nice tight fit, but not too tight. Forcing the tuner into the hole that has a lot of finish buildup and finding out it's too tight can lead to chipping of the finish around the hole when trying to extract it. The reamer or countersink should be on hand. In this case, it wasn't needed. Take care when tightening and threading bushings to the tuner. On a new finish, even though it's buffable, it can still be a little soft when it comes to the bushings. So just fingertip snug for now. Time for the electronics. Let's see if I can do this without screwing up. Thank you. 
I have a very nice Weller soldering station I get to use every day. But if you do not, there's some affordable options out there. I was pleasantly surprised with some of these inexpensive small soldering irons I got on Amazon. I have one at home and it's still chugging away. At 60 watts and up, and for about 10 to $25, you can get something like this, alone or with accessories. It'll get the job done in a pinch. Remember, the more power, the more better, especially when soldering something that absorbs a lot of heat, like that spring claw. Sometimes it's necessary to scrape the surface of thicker, heavier parts to expose the copper plating underneath the chrome. That will help promote the adhesion of the solder to the metal. You must get the temperature of the metal hot enough so that the solder flows and becomes shiny. Even my Wella can struggle sometimes with larger parts, so I keep some plumber solder on hand to help things along. It's good to have some heat shrink around to prevent any ground wires from shorting out. It helps keep things nice and tidy. I often see factory wiring jobs with way too much slack. All that extra wire can invite unwanted noise and hum, like a big long antenna. Well, there she is, all assembled and ready to go. I apologize for not going through the rest of the assembly and setup but my phone ran out of storage. We'll be upgrading the camera situation pretty soon. If you learned something and want to see more, please remember to subscribe, like, and comment. I try to respond to all your comments, questions, and ideas. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. And for a consolation prize, I'll subject you to a little final footage recorded on my tablet. My lame guitar playing. You're busy, God. God bless. Bye-bye.